we told you how we felt and then we put the ball in your court and said it's mm -hmm. up to you. What, what do you want to do? Yeah. And you chose to delay communication with him. Mm -hmm. Hey everyone, welcome to Ex Bundy Diaries. My name is Ellie, my pronouns are she, her, and in this video I'm going to tell you all the story of my first Bundy heartbreak. I pined over the same boy for three years of my teenage life despite only seeing him in person for a total of three days. Yes, you heard that correctly, because in my largely isolated, highly controlled life, three days could hold the same weight and significance as three years. The first thing you need to know about Fundy heartbreaks is that they are often unnecessary. In I Kiss Dating Goodbye, Joshua Harris promises that following courtship, will keep you from opening your heart to the wrong person and getting hurt. But for many kids and teenagers, having crushes and being attracted to others is an important part of growing up. And when parents deliberately shame their children for having crushes and forbid them from even talking to the person that they're attracted to, this can end up causing a lot more suffering than if they had just let their children learn and grow and make mistakes. Take Lydia Plath, for example. Welcome to Plathville is my favorite reality show about a large Fundy family because their family dynamics most resemble the dynamics in my family growing up, at least from what we're shown on TV. I love watching Micah and Mariah follow their passions and express themselves, and I'm rooting for Ethan and Olivia to find happiness and healing. But of all the Plath family members, Lydia is my favorite. I feel a close kinship with her as the joyful, earnest peacemaker with an underlying current of anxiety and resentment at being overworked and underappreciated. In the current season especially, season three, I really relate to the way that she remains dedicated to her family and her faith, while at the same time trying to branch out just a little bit and push the boundaries ever so slightly. The way she thinks, the way she carries herself, and even the way she dresses reminds me so much of my younger self at age 16 and 17. Lydia's relationship with her mom, Kim, is scarily reminiscent to my own relationship with my mom during my teenage years. My perception as a viewer of the show and as someone who was raised in a very similar environment, having almost the same exact values instilled in me, is that Lydia confides in her mom for two reasons. The first reason is that she feels obligated to share her innermost thoughts, feelings, and desires because her mom is like her moral compass. I would guess that her mom's voice is in her head at all times, analyzing her every move. The psychological term for this is enmeshment. According to goodtherapy.org, enmeshment describes a blurring of boundaries between people, typically family members, Enmeshment often contributes to dysfunction in families and may lead to a lack of autonomy and independence that can become problematic. I learned the term enmeshment from my own therapist and have found it to be one of the most helpful and validating terms that I have ever heard. To me, enmeshment basically means that you don't know exactly where you end and another person begins. This is exactly what my relationship with my mom was like during my teenage years and beyond. I think the most obvious sign of enmeshment between Lydia and Kim this season is Lydia's lack of privacy. Kim reads all of Lydia's texts and Lydia has been trained to believe that this is reasonable. Sometimes I'll go on and I'll just scroll through and see who she's talking to. That's how I saw that she was spending a lot of time texting that boy, probably a hundred texts a day which got to, that was the red flag that I was like, okay, we need to talk about this, that's excessive. Here's my concern. I saw you really, really quickly become emotionally invested. And I feel like that's without really knowing him. Kim doesn't want Lydia to start a relationship with a boy she met at a homeschool conference. And Lydia says that she understands her mom's hesitation and is choosing to take her advice. We told you how we felt and then we put the ball in your court and said it's mm -hmm. up to you. What, what do you want to do? Yeah. And you chose 
to delay communication with him. Mm -hmm. So that ball is still in your court. Mm -hmm. If you want to change it, you can. To people watching who did not grow up in Christian fundamentalism, it may appear to them that Lydia is thinking for herself and ultimately making her own decision. But the truth is, she isn't allowed to think for herself. And she herself says this in a roundabout way. As long as she is living under her parents' roof, she has to obey them because the Bible says so. She also wants her mother's love and approval, which is directly dependent on her obedience. There's this clip of Kim leaning in and hugging Lydia and saying, that's my girl with a big smile on her face. And that moment was so familiar to me. The second reason I think Lydia confides in her mom so much is that she doesn't really have anyone else. Being homeschooled means being home all the time. Opportunities to get out and socialize are few and far between, and amidst the long hours of household drudgery and family drama and dysfunction, her thoughts are churning around inside with nowhere to go. I'm just trying to think like, if my mom knows exactly where I'm at in this relationship, and I'm really the only one that knows, and it's hard to explain um, everything that's going on not only in the relationship, but like in my thoughts, like what, what I'm trying to process here. Yes, she has God to pray to, but he's not much of a sounding board. In my experience, the Christian homeschool life is extremely lonely. My heart breaks for Lydia when she shares in her interviews how tempted she is to just pick up her phone and text this boy, because I know exactly how she feels and how earnest she is in her active denial of her own desires. What she wants to do is so low stakes, but in this world, almost anything can become a crisis. And I know that I am unable to see inside of Kim's brain, and I will never know for sure her true motivations. But when she says that Lydia can't pursue a relationship with this homeschool boy because they live too far away, I call bullshit. I think if they lived in the same city, Kim still wouldn't let them communicate. And the reason would be that they lived too close. Not only is he a homeschooled Christian like her parents would want, but she is more than willing to do the whole courtship nonsense. She is literally following their exact worldview. And somehow, it's still forbidden. In my opinion, it all boils down to control and psychological dynamics that Kim probably doesn't have the self-awareness to realize. Lydia is her housekeeper, her nanny, and her best friend all in one, and Kim isn't ready to lose that. The other thing you need to know about Fundy heartbreaks is that you're often set up for them. Fundy girls and femmes are taught growing up that our whole purpose in life is to grow up to be a wife and a mom. We are taught that we exist for men, we are created to be his helpmeet. We're encouraged to pray for a godly husband, and in the meantime, to write letters to this phantom future spouse. And at the same time that all of this focus is put on fulfilling our destiny to be a bride, we're told not to think about it, to just wait on God and expect a relationship to just magically manifest out of thin air. And Lydia explains this really well in one of her interviews. She says about her mom, she's kind of saying like, you should take it slow, but also know him better. Like, how do I not communicate, but get to know him? I feel your pain, Lydia. I feel your pain. My first funny heartbreak started with a wedding when I was 14 years old. Our neighbor was getting married and she had invited me to be the junior bridesmaid in her wedding party. Her fiance's nephew was only two years older than me and would be the junior groomsman, and she felt that we would look great walking down the aisle together. I didn't know this neighbor very well, but my mom had helped her with something, and she wanted to express her gratitude to my mom by including me in her wedding. I was not particularly excited about being part of this wedding, and I felt more and more nervous as the time approached. When I was little, her fiance's son had spit in my hair at a barbecue, and I was worried that his nephew would have a similar personality. I was also extra wary of any and all non-Christians. 
and I knew that our neighbor and her fiancé did not share our faith or our values, as evidenced by the fact that they lived together, which we obviously viewed as a sin. The first time that I would meet this junior groomsman was at the rehearsal dinner, and then the wedding was the following day. Here is a series of journal entries chronicling my experience. October 22nd, 2005. Our neighbor's wedding has been lurking, waiting to eat me up with a partner like her fiance's son or worse. I was scared. That was until I met Keith yesterday. That's not his real name, but I'm gonna call him Keith. Keith is the nicest, most polite, considerate, caring, strongest, mature Christian boy I have ever met. He is so different than the world, in and not of, and yet he can get along with both sides of the family and make you crack up in two seconds. The only word to describe him is special, in the best way ever. I went in ready to meet him for the first time, dreading it, shivering in my tennis shoes. I came out not being able to wait for the next day, the wedding. We hit it off from the beginning. He is so easy to talk to. Today, I don't think there was 10 seconds when we were together that we didn't talk. We talked about everything. Home life, family life, social life, the world, Christianity, and likes and dislikes. He was so open with me. I loved it. He wants to grow up to go into ministry, maybe be a minister or a missionary. I have only known this kid two days and I already feel closer to him than any other boy. Our faith gave us a lot of common ground. When he said, so rumor has it that you're a Christian, my heart leapt. When he said he was too, I shook his hand, congratulating him. And then I gave him a hug and told him how wonderful and rare it was to find one in the crowd. <laughs> Yikes, so much homeschooler energy right there. I really think he likes me. I didn't say anything to mom and dad, but maybe even a tiny bit more than a friend. But I don't care. All I want to be right now is his friend. Right after the ceremony, he said that he had to get my email so we could stay in touch. I cringed as I told him that I didn't have the internet. He was really bummed. Around eating time, he left me to go mingle. I watched him go from table to table. He stopped at my family's table and talked to them for a long time. I was impressed and very happy. He is so mature. He came back to sit with me and talk to me at the head table. And even though the guys were supposed to be on one side and the girls on the other, he sat next to me to talk. I was overjoyed. It was then that he told me how happy he was that I was his partner. I was all too happy to second that. He lamented the fact that I didn't have email and asked, so do I have to do it the old fashioned way? Write it out and put it in the mail? As if he had to write me somehow. Then he said something I think he regretted saying. You know who you remind me of? He asked. Who? I replied, ready to die with curiosity. Well, when you came out this morning down the aisle, you looked like the elf princess from the Lord of the Rings. That may sound kind of cheeky. I had to admit that I hadn't seen it. When I told dad about the wedding later, I asked him what the elf princess was like. He said she always had a certain glow about her. Very beautiful. Then I had to tell him that Keith said I looked like her. I'm sure I was bright red. Obviously, he sees something in me that he likes, and I love it. We have his address, and I want so bad to write him. I ache to get to know Keith better. And then in parentheses, what a blessing from the Lord. He's my brother in Christ. <laughs> so many confusing messages about boys being your brother in Christ, even when you have a crush on them. I think I was probably trying to convince myself here that I just wanted to be friends. Dad said it would be fine to write him as long as my letters were proofread. Mom says that she wants me to wait until we get email, which could be never. She says that letters are more personal. That's my point. I want to get to know him better. I want to be his friend. Dad thinks I like Keith more than a friend. I gave him to the Lord along with all other boys, in that way at least. I guess it's ridiculous to cry over someone you've only known for two days. Well, that's what I'm doing. So call me ridiculous. I think I'm taking this overboard. 
but it's going to take me a while to give this up fully to God's hands. Even if a DSL line never exists in our home. P.S. Dad said that the elf princess was glowing. I've been thinking, I think that's what Keith sees in me, the glow of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> so cheesy. October 24th, 2005. Mom has suggested that I look at my situation this way. If it's God's will, Keith will contact me. I think that would be a great way to look at it if he had my address or my number. I feel like I'm letting him down in that way. I have his address and his number because of his mom and sister coming to the bridal shower. Dad thinks I should write a short note with my info just so Keith has it. But I don't think he's gonna run it by mom yet and I'm not going to ask her as of right now. I think both mom and dad are stressed about something and mom was crying this morning. So right now my task, being a bond servant to Jesus, is patience. No matter what, I can always know and trust that I am in God's hands and he will do his perfect will in my life if I let him. See, your parents' will for you is basically God's will for you. I was taught to go directly to God and get direction from him, but it was really just my parents telling me what they wanted. And that would always, always, always be God's will for my life. October 25th, 2005. The next day. What a fool I have been. Oh Lord, what a fool. Thinking this whole time that I was seeking your perfect will when I was just thinking of myself. I've made such an obsession out of Keith, Lord God. What a fool I have been. Oh Lord, what a fool. There's a reason why he was becoming an obsession for me. It's because I was barely allowed to do anything. <laughs> so the fact that I met this really cool kid that was really nice and I really liked him was a really, really big deal. It was a very bright spot in an otherwise mostly dull existence. Okay, this is later that day. I made my decision. I've seen my mistake. I thought I was seeking God's will, but really I was just seeking my own in my heart. I was hiding the truth from myself. I was praying, Lord, help your will to be mine instead of help my will to be thine. Keith will not get the letter I was writing out a few days ago. I am giving him up. Not that it'll be easy. After I announced this to my parents, I walked calmly down the hall to my room and burst into tears when the door clicked. Dad says that if Keith is really interested in a relationship with me, he will get my address without my help. And if he's not, he won't. Mom says this way I'll know if it is meant to be. I guess Keith will remain as the two-day blessing the Lord bestowed on me. I'll never see Keith again, but at least I'm not making a big mistake. That's how this was framed. Even just sending a platonic letter that was proofread to a boy was potentially a big mistake that could like ruin my life somehow. November 8th, 2005. We got the pictures from the wedding developed today. When I showed dad pictures of me and Keith, he said he was not what he expected him to be. He thought Keith would be cute or really attractive. I was happy. That showed that I wasn't some kind of shallow person. Keith's not cute, but I don't think he's ugly. He's your average Joe with your not so average heart. He really touched my life and he matters to me deeply. Even if I did only talk to him for about four hours, I'm not keeping the pictures where I can look at them a lot. I need to give him to the Lord completely. Then he will bless me, whether it's Keith or someone else. See, there's that prosperity gospel that's a big part of purity culture. Trust God, surrender, follow his will, and then he will bless you. Now, if I could just remember all that when my feelings get the best of me, dot, 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 <laughs> and then I put, uh, Psalm 62.5. Psalm 62.5 was basically what became my Keith verse. I had verses for different situations and things that I was struggling with. Psalm 62.5 says, 
My soul, wait in silence for God only, for my hope is from him. And I would tell myself, wait for God, Ellie, not a letter. Over the next three years, I would think about Keith a lot and really miss him. At the same time, I would beat myself up internally for thinking that maybe he would write me and for wanting him to, while at the same time reminding myself to surrender this desire to the Lord and to wait for God only, not a letter. This is what I mean by unnecessary heartbreak. Why couldn't my parents have just let me write this boy a letter? I was totally fine with them proofreading my letters and reading his if he chose to write me back. He even lived a few hours away from us, so there was no reason for them to fear that I would hold his hand or kiss him or violate any of their rules. I was so obedient and eager to please. I wasn't trying to rebel in the slightest. All I wanted was to keep that connection that I felt with another human being who made me happy. And they wouldn't even allow that. When I was 17, we finally got the internet. And one of the very first things I did when I got a Facebook was search for Keith. From his profile, I found out that he was attending a Christian college and that he was dating someone that I will call Mary. After messaging back and forth with him for a little while, he told me he would be coming home for the holidays on a break and asked if he could come visit me as friends. To my complete shock, my parents said yes. So I asked him if Mary was okay with it, even though it was just friends, and he assured me that he had told her and she was. So I spent a whole day with Keith out to lunch with my family, hanging out at my house with my younger siblings, taking a walk together, just the two of us, running an errand for my dad and helping him put up the Christmas tree, and then out to a date-like dinner. All throughout, despite being in a relationship with Mary, Keith flirted with me and called me a beautiful, amazing woman of God. He also initiated a lot of physical affection with me when my parents weren't around including taking my hand on the walk while he prayed for me out loud and kissing me on the cheek in his dark parked car after dinner. I waffled between excitement and joy over my first ever romantic physical affection and guilt and worry over whether this was okay and whether or not Mary would really be okay with it even though he kept assuring me that she was. According to him, I was his biggest crush in high school, and he too was waiting for me to reach out to him. He also said that he actually asked Mary for permission to kiss me on the cheek because he had wanted to do it for three years. And according to him, she said yes. Now, in retrospect, with my knowledge of Christian dating, I find this highly suspect. I would be shocked if he really asked her and she really said okay. Because in my experience, there is a lot of jealousy involved in Christian dating. And obviously the boundaries are extremely strict for couples, let alone people outside of those couples. When he finally went home that night, I confessed to my parents about the flirting and the kiss on the cheek. They took a similar approach to the one that Kim took with Lydia. They strongly urged me to break off contact with Keith, but framed it in a way that made it seem like I had a choice in the matter. I agreed instantly in that conversation with my parents because not only did I want to please them, but I felt a lot of purity culture guilt over the affection with Keith and a lot of confusion and worry over the fact that he had a girlfriend. That being said, it was really painful and I cried like my life was over and the next day I didn't eat anything at all. I had had so much fun with Keith and I was so smitten with him and with the idea of being in a romantic relationship. The way we had behaved that day was as if we were together and that new feeling was very appealing to me. There was a part of me that hoped he would break up with his girlfriend and choose me instead. 
Keith respected my request to end contact, at least for the first few weeks. Then, out of the blue, he left me a voicemail telling me that he had had a hard time after our day together, but that God had done a great work in his heart, and now he was completely over me, and that he had told Mary the same. Looking back now, I imagine her standing next to him as he left me this voicemail. It was tough for me to hear this, but if that wasn't shocking enough, a couple weeks after that, he left me another voicemail, this time saying that he and Mary had completely broken up and that he needed me in his life. He said he was in so much pain over this breakup and basically was asking me to comfort him. At this point, even as a naive homeschooler, I could tell that he was going through something that had nothing to do with me. So I decided to call him back and explain that I wished him well, but that I was going to unfriend him on Facebook so that I could move on. I'm actually really proud of my younger self for having the courage and insight to do this. I wasn't anywhere near over him at that moment and letting him go was really hard. Seeing Keith again after three years had a huge impact on me. I had already spent so much time thinking about him, missing him, surrendering him to God, and wondering what could have been if my parents had allowed me to write him a letter. So actually being able to reconnect with him felt like a miracle, which made saying that final goodbye feel that much more monumental. He was also extremely charming and persuasive, which made me feel like I knew him better than I actually did. I opened up to him about my family trauma in one day because I felt safe enough to be vulnerable with him. For a homeschool girl who wasn't allowed to date or kiss until the altar, my day with Keith felt like a magical but very confusing dream. I was swept off my feet, dizzy with all these new and exciting experiences happening all at once. Keith's behavior baffled me because of Mary, but I trusted that since he was older and had vastly more experience, he knew what he was doing. I also let him lead all throughout the day, just like I had been taught to do with all the Christian boys and men in my life. I didn't know how to have healthy boundaries with someone who was in a monogamous relationship because I literally knew nothing about relationships. My parents had kept me from having any romantic experiences at all, so I was completely unprepared. When I reflect on this experience, I think about Lydia Plath over and over again. When Keith complimented my eyes, I crossed them to lighten the mood, and I can totally picture Lydia doing something like that. I can imagine her trying to be pure and chaste, while at the same time wanting to give in to her desires for romance and adventure with a boy she really liked. I hope Lydia ends up being able to get to know her special friend, as she calls him. I hope she's able to have fun and experience life and ultimately be herself. I'll be eagerly watching the rest of season three of Welcome to Plathville, cheering Lydia on. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.